Hey, guess what, Rockheads? Progress Telerik wants to send someone to build. So they're having a contest. Step one is to sign up and learn about the new innovative modern UI tools they'll be announcing at Build. By registering, you'll be entered to win a full conference pass to Microsoft Build plus a $500 travel stipend. They're also giving away three Telerik DevCraft UI licenses. And for .NET Rocks listeners, they'll also be giving away a Telerik DevCraft UI license every week. All you have to do is register at buildcontest.pwop.me. That's buildcontest.pwop.me. Progress offers the leading platform for developing and deploying mission-critical business applications. The creator of the award-winning Telerik, .NET, and Kendo UI, JavaScript, user interface components and controls, reporting solutions, and productivity tools, Progress offers all the tools developers need to build high-performant modern apps with outstanding UI. Go now to buildcontest.pwop.me and sign up to win. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. Here for another Geek Out. It's been a while. It's been a while since we've been geeking out. How are you, Richard? I'm good, man. I mean, I've obviously been crazy busy right. hammering away at the book, um, which clearly, I mean, we sort of called it a geek out, although they didn't tag it as such for show 1500. Mm. But looking at the download numbers, people are pretty interested in the history of .NET. It's the most downloaded show this year. Or last year. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. guess it was last year, right? Yeah, yeah, it was last year. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's just uh, obviously important to some people, and uh, I'm working hard on it. I still don't know what I'm going to publish. I mean, there's, I've got about, I mean, we're at the end of March here. I've got about 40 hours of interviews done, and I feel like I'm a quarter of the way through. Yeah. Oh, well, I've been really interested to see how many just rock stars in the history of .NET are just opening up to you, man. What What is it about you? Why are you so magical that way? I'm charming. Yeah, that, I don't know. I, I think part of it is, of course, I'm friends with a lot of them. Right. But I also feel like this is a story that people want told. Like the, mm. internally, the folks that worked on it, it's very funny to me in these interviews that I've had that it takes a while for them to sort of remember to go back to those early days. So, you yeah. know, I'm, I've got a very crisp timeline now of when things happen and the order things happen between the conferences and releases and so forth mm. to help them get into the groove to sort of walk, especially the, when you talk about, you know, talking to a guy like Anders Halsberg back, going back to the 90s, very challenging to try and get them back into that headspace. But sure. it's, it's worked so far. And I think it's very, it's almost cathartic to just sort yeah. of talk through some of those issues and things. So um, I, you know, I don't know how much of this to write. I and mean, one of the things I feel <laughs> like I'm doing is for the forensics of helping people miss who may have misremembered some things. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, you know, the history sort of got rewritten at times. And so it's very interesting when you sort of, I'm checking people's facts, essentially. You know, mm. I only, I only believe in a meeting once I've got three different people talking about that meeting. You know, that mm. kind of discovery process. And that's been very interesting, but it takes a lot of time. I'm pleased how, with how it's yeah. coming, but I'm afraid it may, it may be 2019. I don't know. I'd love to get it done this year. Do it right, man. I, take that's time, what I do feel. it right. I feel yep. like it's better to take more time, get it right, than it is to uh, to race through this thing. Well, it's going to have an honored place on my coffee table, let me tell you. <sighs> well, I'll have to make great. the coffee table book version, maybe lots of photos and stuff. Who knows? I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to even make. You know, the logical thing for me to make is a book and then, you know, do my own audio book of it. Sure. But uh, there's many possibilities there. It, it, who knows? We'll figure it out. Who knows? Awesome. Well, I have an incredible story for you from the internets for Better Know Frameworks. So awesome. roll the music. All right, dude. What do you got? So I've been holding on to this one since February 2nd when it published in Engadget. Tesla will sell solar panels and power walls at Home Depot. Love Tesla it. branded selling spaces are coming to 800 retail locations. And um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff about the 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 costs of it all and uh, all of that stuff. But I just decided to go over to HomeDepot.com and search for Tesla. And guess what? 
What's that? The Tesla Renewable Energy System is right there. Wow. There's no price. It says get a quote during a free in-home consultation. And when you look at how to buy, it says Tesla solar panel systems produce renewable clean energy, allowing you to be energy independent while helping you secure lower utility bills. During your in-home energy consultation, a Tesla solar panel consultant will help you design a solar energy system to best fit your needs and budget. So that's the power wall, the panels, the whole thing. And for those who don't know what the power wall is, that's uh, Elon Musk's big battery <laughs> that uh, basically takes all of the energy um, from your solar panels and evenly distributes it, which is absolutely necessary if you remember our electricity show and our solar energy show, right? Yeah, I mean, the big thing with solar panels is you do need a device to to store the to manage the power properly to insert make it into ac that sort of thing because solar panels are naturally dc mm -hmm. the power wall what's interesting about the power wall is that virtually every solar battery system outside of tesla's is lead acid batteries and that they're big right uh right. he's using his lipo battery technology the same the a different formulation but of similar concept to the cars and so the batteries are actually really small for the amount of power they're packing. Uh, last time I looked, I think it was 14 kilowatts or 10 kilowatts, wow. between 10 and 14 kilowatts in something small enough to hang on a wall. Typically, something in lead acid there would be the size of a room. Wow. So it's really dense power. The real question, and this is the thing I don't know that anybody really knows, is how long will those batteries last? Because the right. reason to stick with lead acid is the chemistry is so well known that you know exactly when it's time to replace those batteries. They get You get a certain number of years out of them. Did I ever tell you what happened with my Prius? No. So you know I had a Prius for many yeah, years. you did. Yeah, and the battery is guaranteed for 10 years. Right. Right? Well, the battery died like a month before the warranty was up. Holy man, that's good timing. And Toyota replaced it absolutely free. That's brilliant. I I couldn't have been happier because normally that doesn't happen in my favor. No, Usually it's right after the warranty. It's actually the other way around, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, and, it, and you know, they think this is part of the challenge with these tech is you're just not sure. Where, uh, where all this stuff is going to fall, right? And so I think he's taking a bit of a gamble. Although so far, when you look at the battery lifespan data for the older Tesla cars, mm. they're doing extremely well, better yeah. than expected. Yeah, yeah. And so that sort of speaks to this. these techs might work out pretty good. The solar panel roofing is really interesting because, of course, you need to price it as a roof as well as solar panels. And as I understand it, having read a bunch of the documentation, you're not putting a solar panel in every roof tile. Like it's it's a mix based on how much power you can handle, which really has a lot to do with how much power wall you have, the orientation of your roof yeah. based on the location of your house. Like all of those things matter in terms of how many solar panels you should take on. And how much and, sun you get, right? I and, mean Yeah, it's how much sun you get. Yeah. Uh but you think about it, if you you know, if you've got a sloping if you live in a higher latitude, like if you're in Montana and your roof, you've got a sloping roof that aims north, you no know, amount of solar panels are going to save you, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> like you, it, it matters how your roof is oriented. It's, you know, more interesting is east and west. Right. You know, because then you, you actually get more power. Both. Yeah, you put power panels on both mm. and but might actually struggle for power midday, which is okay because you don't need that much power in your house midday. But early in the morning, right. late in the evening kind of makes more sense. So, mm. you know, there's a reason they need consultants and that you need some help with all of that stuff. Right, right. So let's get to the topic, man. Uh, I guess this was spurred on by your um, fascination with Tesla and the, the Falcon Heavy. And But you, when you were starting to do research, you found that there was so much more to the story about heavy lift rockets than just the Falcon Heavy. I mean, everybody jumped on the crazy bandwagon for Falcon Heavy flying. And you yeah. watched it. I watched it. Yep, it was crazy. I mean, it was, it was magic. And... And actually, my comment, the comment I have to read is directly related to that. Okay. So this is a comment off of the last quote, the last Space Geek Out, the 1486, mm -hmm. which was about the new BFR, the revised mm -hmm. BFR, the smaller one, which I think, you know, really going to be an important rocket. Mm -hmm. And of course, we get lots of good comments on the Geek Outs. This one comes from Charles Wallace. 
uh, who said, as a SpaceX nut, I can't wait for them to reach Mars. I worry that they seem to be ignoring the issue of Mars being contaminated by Earth bacteria. Hmm. I'm thinking that this issue is a lot more powerful than they think, and it could derail the whole thing. Are there any practical ways to address these fears? While it seems likely, even if contamination happened, we'd be able to distinguish invading bacteria from pre-existing bugs, then there's a chance that there's nothing on Mars anyway. Nevertheless, you know, this matters to a lot of people. And uh, by the way, I love the Geek Outs and the show. You guys rock. You rock too, Charles. Yeah. And admittedly, at the time, I responded to Charles just in the messages where I said, look, like there's hardly any atmosphere on, on Mars. There are toxic perchlorates in the soil that's, that are lethal to, to big animals, not just uh, bacteria. Uh, there is certainly concern by scientists when they send spacecraft to Mars to do evaluations of life on Mars to make sure that the spacecraft are not contaminated Mars. So they do a lot of sterilization of anything being sent to Mars. And the only way you can sterilize effectively is they bake everything at extremely high temperatures. Mm, that kills stuff. Yeah. So yeah. like the Viking spacecraft back in the 70s, they bake them at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, Yikes. 170 Celsius for several weeks to get bacterial counts down so low that they could be fairly confident that nothing be detected. And you got to think about it. heating something that much, scientific instruments that much. How do you not damage them? Mm. Yeah, right. You know, that's an interesting problem. It's and just how like, do you build them to withstand that kind of heat? Exactly. And still be usable afterwards and then not contaminate. You know, you have to have them basically assembled before you do the sterilization because you essentially can't touch them after that. There's more bacteria on your fingertips mm. than there is on the spacecraft at that mm -hmm. point. So... It's very, it's an interesting problem. And I think Charles is on to something here that f solving, Elon is completely underestimating that issue. And he seems to underestimate issues around NASA a fair bit. And he's starting to run into them more and more. And we'll talk about these further into the show. It's one of the reasons that NASA has never gone, met, had done a mission to Mars to go get water. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just a real, real, I recently read a piece around this where they're saying, we know we can extract water from Mars. We have good ideas where they are. We're finding more all the time. Hmm. It's not even especially difficult to do. The problem is that where there's water, there's likely some kind of life. Right. And the cost to sterilize the mission, to build a mission that can be sterilized to the level where we could safely touch that water without contaminating it, it is not worthwhile. Ah, okay. So, so they're not worried about doing it. So they kind of know how to do it. So they're working on the things they don't know how to do. Right. And they're trying to keep costs down. Which it, is exactly. Good. They have a limited budget. There yeah. are smarter things to spend your money on. Right. There's going to be a crisis when, if and when, Elon actually gets to the point where he can fly missions to Mars with the intent to colonize. Mm. Uh, here comes contamination. And we are going to have a debate about what's more important, protecting Mars from our contamination versus inhabiting another planetary body how about protecting us from mars's contamination i mean if you're saying there's water there there's got to be bacteria i mean it doesn't have to be but there probably is right now the known danger it, it's very unlikely that alien bacteria martian bacteria would know how to interact with our bodies hmm. like it, it probably wouldn't work like that's not a real risk factor but that's i get what you're saying the really known dangers right now for humans uh I would say the perchlorates are going to be the most pernicious problem. Yeah, that's what those Muppets that sing the Menomina song eat. Right? And they're up there somewhere. <laughs> so you got to watch out for those guys. But that's, that, you know, therein lies a real challenge. It's like the per interaction with perchlorates are a known impediment to thyroid function in humans. What's a perchlorate anyway? So a, a perchlorate is a naturally occurring compound caused by interaction of ultraviolet radiation against the soils. Okay. Okay, and mm. so it's, but the problem is the compound acts much like iodine, and so it will interfere with your thyroid. Uh. Now, it's easy, they, and they do occur in certain parts of the world, right? The Atacama Desert in Chile, which is uh, very a Mar Mars analog, also has some perchlorates. Hmm. Now, you can, you can fix them, you can chemically react them out, but right. you have to deal with that. And you've got these fines on Mars, this very fine dust that's right. going to be steeped in perchlorates because mm. you're going to get the dust on your suit. So, you know, every Martian 
movie we've ever seen with our science fiction addled minds. <laughs> you walk your suit into the lab. Mm. Right. And maybe they've, you know, like in the Martian, they had a little steam cleaning process that was going to blow all the dust off, which seems mm. awfully optimistic. <laughs> the far more likely thing is that the suit will never enter the, the, the lab, that you will actually back your suit into a, uh, a pressurized mount, which will scrub down the back of your suit and the back of your suit will open up and you'll climb into the lab. So mm. the vast majority of your suit stays outside all the time. Uh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Well, it's just these are the kinds of real problems we're going to deal with. The challenge then is how do you do maintenance on the suit? You know, gloves right. wear out. They're, yeah. the, they're the first part on a, on a suit to wear out because of the efforts you have moving your hands around in them. So you're going to need replacement gloves. And how do you change them without getting perchlorates on you? Or Maybe you just burn sensation? them. You can light fires in space. I know there's no oxygen, but it can be done, right? <laughs> there, there are <laughs> solutions. But this is just the raft of problems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Charles, thank you so much for your comment. And actually, he sent me another email several huh. weeks before this one, or so, right in the same time span, that I'm going to read later. Okay. Related to the Falcon Heavy launch. Right, uh, cool. And so, Charles, thanks for your comment. A .NET Rocks mug is on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks .com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. And if you comment there or read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And definitely follow us on Twitter. He's at Rich Campbell. I'm at Carl Franklin. Send us a tweet. We responsibly discharge all of them before we dispose of them. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, lots of people yelling about making a, a show around Falcon Heavy. And my first reaction was, what is there to talk about? Yeah, right. It, it wasn't that big deal. And one of the other comments on that show was was along those lines. It basically said, why is everybody so enamored? Why was Falcon Heavy so impactful? There's no doubt that it was. I got to tell you, the thing that made that gave me pause was seeing the, the picture of the dummy in a Tesla floating in space with the earth in the background and i thought it was a photoshop job i yeah. honestly thought what that's not real come <laughs> it on can't be real and then i just slowly began to wake up to the this guy actually put a tesla on the top of a rocket put it into space as a publicity stunt yep wow well it could have been a block of concrete right true you need a payload uh, in his previous test payload for the original Falcon 9, he sent up a 200-pound wheel of cheese. <laughs> I didn't know that. And brought it back. <laughs> I bet that was delicious, actually. It was space cheese. <laughs> space cheese. Hey, the moon is made of cheese. But this, I mean, this is the thing. is like I admit it's a bit of a publicity stunt, without a doubt. And the, the fact they put cameras and stuff on it, they stuck the suit in it, they put Don't Panic uh, on right. this display. Uh, there, were, if you look really closely, you go back and watch on the dash. There is a Hot Wheels model of the the Tesla uh, Roadster on mm. the dash mm. with a little guy stuffed in it. <laughs> like, it's there's meta. a lot of gags, right? And uh, and to clear a few questions up, people have said like, when is it, is it going to impact Mars or anything like that? He was now it's in a solar orbit. So yeah. what's the the Falcon Heavy did something important there that it actually flew. Out beyond Earth orbit, which is yeah. the first time any of any you know non-government uh, spacecraft has done that. Wow! Uh, and but it is in a solar orbit. It was originally they were going to boost it far enough to show they had enough power to get it to an, an orbit equivalent to the Mars orbit, but they had more power than that, so it's closer to the asteroid boil, closer to Ceres than anything else. So it's going to eventually just burn up in the sun. Well, that's the highest probability. So a group of, of uh, astrophysicists figured out what the orbit was and then started doing some computational models. And so there is a slight possibility that it'll come back to Earth and burn up in the, in the, in the Earth atmosphere. And the second stage is still connected to the Tesla, okay? okay? They never dumped the second stage. In fact, one of the big tests they were doing there was showing that the second stage a, could fly through the Van Allen belts because they'd never done that before, which is why they had the six-hour delay to do all the, the great, that got us all that great footage of the, the Tesla Roadster. Right. 
and then flew it back and forth through the Van Allen belts a bit and then did the final burn to depletion or burn to lose too little fuel to run reliably that got it into this really wide orbit. But remember, it's going to be an egg-shaped orbit. It's right. it's coming down towards the orbit of Earth and then back out to the orbit of Ceres. Now, when it comes back down, Earth's not going to be there. Uh, I just but, want to go back to one thing that you mentioned, the Van Allen mm-hmm. belt. That's like an area of radiation, isn't it? Yes. So there's two sets of Van, Van, Van Allen belts. And they are a concentration of uh, protons in one belt and electrons in the other belt caused by the solar wind and the magnetic and interaction with the magnetic field of the Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, the Apollo astronauts avoided the the proton belt, the inner belt, by doing a uh, an interesting uh, insertion profile. But the main thing you do is you get through it as quickly as possible. Right. But considering they just They've never really tested if the electronics of the navigation and control systems can operate in those conditions. They just wanted to prove they could. Hey, uh, Richard, hold that thought here while we take a moment for this very important message. We've all come to expect that distributed databases can't be both globally consistent and scalable. But what if you didn't have to make trade-offs? What if you could have a fully managed database service that's consistent, scales horizontally across data centers, and speak SQL. Introducing Cloud Spanner, a mission-critical relational database service from Google Cloud Platform. Built from the ground up and battle-tested at Google for strong consistency and high availability at a global scale. Learn more about Cloud Spanner online at g.co slash getspanner. That's g.co slash getspanner. And we're back. We're geeking out. Richard Campbell's talking about uh, heavy rockets, heavy lift rockets, and we're, right. we're we're starting with the Falcon Heavy. So, and and the big chunk of the story is going to end up being a Falcon Heavy, but I think one of the things that was important about the Falcon Heavy is that it was the first super heavy lift rocket uh, to fly um, since, I mean, arguably shuttle. Most people say Saturn V, right? Yeah, Sa- that Saturn V is it was the heavy the the heavy a heavy lift rocket and just to define these categories so small lift rocket is less than two metric tons medium lift is two to twenty metric tons uh-huh. uh, of payload going to low Earth orbit okay heavy lift rockets which is we get you know it was twenty to fifty metric tons and so that is Ariane five Delta four heavy and the Russian Proton M are all operational. Rockets in that category, although Delta F4 Heavy on its way out. There's only a couple hmm. more flights left of it. Hmm. Theoretically, the Falcon 9 full thrust would qualify as a heavy lift rocket because if you run it in full expendable mode, it should be able to lift 22.8 metric tons. So it just gets over the threshold of heavy lift. But it's never done it. The heaviest payload a Falcon 9 full thrust has ever lifted is 9.6 metric tons, and that's Iridium payloads, 10 satellites. Wow. It's, and it's sort of one of the big truths here is, have you got a payload? You yeah, know, right. Everyone's pretty excited about Falcon Heavy being a, super, a new super heavy lift rocket when there's none operational right now, which is true. And right. super heavy lift is above 50 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Yeah. But Falcon Heavy's only lifted 1.3 metric tons, a Tesla Roadster. But as you said, you know, we're going to need a rocket like this to do the kinds of things that we want to do in space in the future. If you want to start playing at higher levels, you know, start to do other kinds of missions, you want to launch a new space station, mm. things like that, you need a more powerful rocket. There's no two ways about it. And so, But even launching parts and ad- adjuncts and, you know, replacement uh, equipment that's heavy up to the space station. Uh, I mean, we do it now in, in smaller pieces, right? Yeah. Well, we, that's what we had to do. That was the justification for the shuttle. Yeah. When the shuttle, the shuttle was designed, the whole idea was we're going to have this thing that flies every week into space. And so assembling in space is going to become normal. That's a logical way to lift satellites. You know, it just didn't deliver on its promise. And the yeah. shuttle itself could only lift 24 metric tons. Okay, and it was a very expensive rocket for lifting that little of weight. You consider that in theory, a Falcon full nine full thrust in full expendable mode could ha- have nearly the same lift as the space shuttle. Although, if you took the shuttle off the stack, meaning what? So 
take those two solid rocket boosters, the most yeah. powerful rockets ever made, mm. period, right? Those two solid rocket boosters on the shuttle, the most powerful rockets ever made. They got problems, but they're really powerful. Okay. Then you take that central fuel tank and you strap three engines to it, get rid of the shuttle part, right? Go fully expendable. Right. There was actually a design called Shuttle C that would do that. You're talking about 120 metric tons of lift. Wow. Like, it's a very powerful rocket. It's just huh. that the shuttle weighed over 100 metric tons. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, because it carried life support system for seven people and all the gear to come back and so forth. If you stripped all that out, it was a real super heavy lift system comparable to Saturn V at 130 metric tons. So it's not that um, the, the Falcon Heavy was revolutionary in how many metric tons it could handle. So what makes it unique in, from all of these other things? The main thing is the reusability. I mean, that's the real impact. You know, when if when a Falcon 9 full thrust recovers its first stage, you're essentially talking about 60% reusable now, right? Yeah. The first stage represents, those nine engines represent a huge amount of the expense. Second stage can't be recovered. They're, the payload fairings, they're playing with trying to recover those, which is interesting. But mm. if you actually get all three boosters back from a, from a Falcon Heavy... Mm. That's a 90% reuse rate. Like these, now the second stage is represents a very small portion of the cost. You get those 27 engines back. Yeah. That's kind of a big deal. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the image of that thing landing was just ecstasy. I mean, I, I can't explain. It was very the, powerful. How I felt. I felt like, wow. I mean, this isn't just, you know, one of the Falcons, the Falcon nines. This is a heavy rocket that just, sat itself down yep it Two was of them. beautiful <laughs> yeah, yeah it it was a, a elon himself was kind of, you look at that press conference after the launch he's yeah. stunned yeah he know? is and yeah. And he, the two things that there was a few things that jumped out of me at what he said. One was, wow, it was just like the video we made. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was that the Tesla Roadster looked terrible in orbit. Like if we mm. had CGI that, it would have looked way better. It's just that because you're outside of the atmosphere, the cameras they're using, which as far as I know, are just GoPros. Yeah. <laughs> um, they're not they're, they're not adjusted for being in outer space. Yeah. Right? They're used to having an atmosphere. So the color spectrum's all wrong. Like, it, it's wrong. And that's why it looks kind of weird. I, I thought it looked amazing. And I thought it was Photoshopped. Yeah. And he's like, nah, if we'd Photoshopped it, it would have looked better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> just unbelievable. And of course, the thing's dead now because they were only, they didn't do anything to the car. They took the battery packs out. Yeah. But they didn't specify it. They didn't add a solar panel or anything like right. that. All of the power that was offered in those cameras and so forth came from the second stage. And the second mm. stage is only designed to last for a few hours, enough time to get stuff into orbit. And then it goes dead. So by the time they fired those engines that put it in that long orbit, Shortly after that, the batteries went dead. Oh, he just needed a few pictures anyway, right? I mean... <laughs> he he made the point. He got he four hours of footage of a car <laughs> orbiting. And the radio was playing uh, the Bowie song too, was it? Supposedly, but of course with no atmosphere. We would know. know. Yeah, we wouldn't know. The, the other, you know, the other impact is a sort of, want to talk about proof of a new billionaire class? Mm. Dude flew his car into space. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> a car that he made yeah. on a rocket that he made. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Flew it to space. That's crazy. What's up with that? Uh, before we finish the first half, because we're coming off on that, I just want to talk about why was Falcon Heavy so late? Okay. Because, I mean, he talked about building a triple rig like that, three side by side, going back as far as 2004 and 2005. That was even before Falcon 9 had really flown, right? But one of his justifications yeah. for never building Falcon 5, a five-engine version of the rocket from Falcon 1 mm -hmm. was that they're going to need 9 to make heavy so let's just go straight to 9. And he yeah. only really he really announced the heavy in 2011 saying our first flights will be in 2013. And he was yeah. wildly late but they were really serious about being 2013. In 2011 they even broke ground on a new launch pad at Vandenberg Air Force Base SLC4E mm. specifically for heavy because the first flight was going to be out of Vandenberg. But the 
if you line up the evolvement of the Falcon 9, you realize that the reason Heavy was late is that as they started studying what it was going to take to build Heavy, they saw opportunities to improve the Falcon 9 itself. Mm. So from the original Falcon 9, which they now call Block 1 or version 1.0 that flew in the early years, the first update, 1.1, started development really in 2011. So around the time they're doing the research, they realize, hey, we can make Falcon 9 longer. Mm. We can change the, we can improve the engines. They go for the Merlin 1Cs, the Merlin 1Ds mm. and build the OctoWeb so that by the time, in the time frame of when they could have flown heavy in 2013, that's when they fly Falcon 1.1. And that, that was 60% performance improvement thrust and weight over the original Falcon 9 1.0. Like, it's a huge leap forward. You now can lift 13 metric tons to low Earth orbit, more than double the performance of the old Falcon 1. So is he hedging his bets and they just made a breakthrough that was unexpected? I think they were learning more about the rocket as they flew it yeah. and as they were realizing, hey, you know, we're gonna, we need to be able to land, right? The 1.1 yeah. was the first rockets they tried to land. None of them ever landed successfully. All the failures you see... Those are 1.1s, and the learning from that actually leads to the Falcon 9 full thrust, version 1.2, mm. 2013 to 2015, right? That's when that rocket gets developed, mm -hmm. and that ups performance again that they get to this 22 metric tons of lift mm. with full expendable. They got that's when they go to the subcooled propellant and oxidizer, so they have more capacity. They put better legs on, they put on the new bigger grid fins. The very first flight of a Falcon 9 full thrust, the 1.2 version, is the first first stage that landed successfully. Had a couple of Viking Sub Zero fridges with the fuel <laughs> in there. <laughs> well, it, it actually was carrying an Orbcom payload, which 11 satellites at once. Right. Like it was a great launch. And you remember wow. that was the first landing back on land. Like they did all this crazy stuff. Mm. So in December 2015, when they fly that full thrust, now they've basically built the model that matches their requirements for heavy. Mm. Right. This is a recoverable booster. It lands. Now you've got a booster that can land. Yeah. Well, guess what time it is now, Richard? Hey, it must be that happy time again. Yeah, it's time to get out my Estes rocket kit and build a rocket powerful enough to launch a .NET Rocks mug into space, deliver it to the floating Tesla Roadster, and get the dummy to take a selfie. Nice. Oh, if it were only that easy. <laughs> <laughs> I told you about the enormous Estes rocket that my brother built when he was a kid, right? Yeah. Do you remember those Estes model rockets? For sure. The big motors were the D motors. The D engines. He had yeah. a 5D stage rocket. Oh, man. Five, That's a lot of rocket. Five stage. Each stage had a D. <laughs> that thing went foom, and we never saw it again. It was gone, yeah. It's... You only get one flight out of a D rocket. <laughs> well, That's now you reality. get five of them. That thing probably was in the Thanosphere. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway. It's actually time to give away a D-Experience subscription from our good friends at DevExpress to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. Become a UI superhero with DevExpress UI controls and libraries and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today and leverage your existing knowledge to build next-generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an Office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. And check out their DevExtreme React Grid, built from the ground up to fully support all the cool features that come with React, like the virtual DOM and state controllers. It supports master detail, sorting, grouping, paging, and editing, and you can get it for free on GitHub. That's the DevExtreme React Grid. But learn more and download your free 30-day trial of DevExpress Universal at devexpress.com slash superhero. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Dmitry Martinov. Oh, congratulations, Dmitry. Yes. I'll clap for you, sir. And Dmitry won the D-Experience subscription that's a big pile of awesome from our friends at DevX just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you want to join, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world, 
In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors, and every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member, but you have to sign up to win. I haven't asked you in a while, Toy Boy. What's, uh, what's, what's on your radar for $5,000 toys? Oh, man, no, I don't have any expensive toys right now. I'm pretty close to finally giving up on my Infinities and switching over to a Tesla. Yeah. Uh, just because I also feel like we're coming to the end of the road for manually driven cars. You know, typically I lease cars for, you know, two to four years, depending on the, the terms of the deal. Mm -hmm. And I figure the car I pick out this year may be the last manually driven car I ever own. Huh. Well, that's cool. You know? So I, I'm kind of thinking in terms of if you don't buy a Tesla now, you, you may never because once mobility as a service comes true and cars can drive themselves, I'm not going to own one. I'm going to use them on demand. I'm going to pull out an app and mm. say, hey, I need this kind of vehicle in this location at this time, please. And the car will appear, take me where I want to go and then go away. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, on on my mind is spending substantially more than $5,000 for uh, for a Tesla S. Well, that but, would be awesome. Uh, I've driven a couple of those and they're just a joy. Like spectacular machines, no two ways Spectacular machines, yep. That's all I got. What about you? You got anything? Oh no, I'm. Uh, I, I I've got everything I need. Uh, <laughs> you know, some. if I had five thousand dollars, I would uh, add it to the Kickstarter campaign for Keto Fest. Yes, <laughs> which is ending in a couple of days at yep. KetoFest.com. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. So what you're saying is they really didn't start working on heavy until after that first landing in 2015. You know, I think that's a fair description of the situation because every time they went to work on heavy, they ended up tinkering essentially with nine and then wanted to test it anyway. So they, they kept doing that. That's block three and block four rockets. Now they're mm. going to start buying block fives, which seems to be the end of the road for Falcon nine as high performance as it's ever going to get. Mm. So, and in that context to actually fly the heavy, you know, barely two years later, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is. That they actually got there. And they, in some respects, they simplified the rocket because originally they were going to do this thing where they actually would fuel the center core engines from the outside tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so that when the outer boosters were empty, the first stage, would, the center stage would be f completely full. Okay. Um, but they didn't, A, nobody's ever done that. It's incredibly hard to do. And it suddenly became rather unnecessary with all the additional performance improvements they'd gotten by upgrading Falcon 9. Hmm. The main thing that, that took a lot of time was they had the center core now had so much more mass pulling on it with those boosters because the boosters had gotten so much bigger yeah. that it had to be substantially redesigned, strengthened, being able to support the pressure of those additional boosters. And if you recall... Elon was on record saying, I'll be happy if it just clears the pad. Mm. It doesn't damage the pad. Because they were dealing with the pad destruction that had occurred uh, on uh, pad 40. Yeah, yeah. From the uh, Falcon 9 explosion. And right. so he really didn't want to wreck another pad. That's what he was worried about more than anything. And they had sort of hit the computational limits. They really didn't know how the acoustic interaction of 27 engines was going to work. Mm. And those last weeks when they were testing Falcon Heavy were really interesting because they kept bringing out the, the rocket, laying on its side out to, to pad 39A and then standing it up. And then they'd fuel it and then they'd drain it and then they'd lay it back down and they'd take it back. Okay. And that now, was just to test it, right? Now, what were they testing? Well, here's the reality. When you take super cooled fuel like liquid oxygen, the, your oxidizer, and mm -hmm. you pump it in the tank, the tank shrinks. Oh. The entire vehicle shrinks. Now, when you've got one Falcon 9 standing there and it shrinks, sitting over top of its pad, remember it's got hold down clamps, right? right, right. Things to keep it in place till all the engines are lit properly mm -hmm. before you release it. Mm -hmm. So you have to allow those clamps to move to deal mm. with the shrinkage as you fuel it. Now, if you only got one of them, it just shrinks inward, just mm. around a single center core. Now mm. you've got three of them strapped together. They all shrink inward, but it means the outer ones also pull in towards the center core a long way. Mm. So they literally were measuring how far it had to move 
then draining it, adjusting the way the clamps worked, then bring it back out and try it again. And it took him a couple of tries to get it right. But if those hold down clamps had binded, the thing wasn't going to fly. That's just basic engineering right there. Well, and tricky science problems, right? Yeah, like you yeah. don't understand the stress that goes on in a, in a spacecraft like that with super cold fuel on the inside, mm. contracting all the metal, and the friction of the atmosphere on the outside, heating it up. Yeah. Now, finishing up with the Falcon Heavy flight, because it did fly beautifully. Yep. We lost the center core. What does that mean? So they, oh, you saw the two inner, uh, outer boosters land back on land beautifully. Right. The inner core was supposed to land out on a the barge. Oh. It was supposed to land, and they did try. Okay. And it actually uh, got close. It was within a hundred yards of the huh. uh, of the the ship when it when it crashed. What happened was because the core is so much beefier and moving so much faster because it's been boosted so high, they actually wanted to land on three engines instead of one. Okay. So they they were supposed to light three engines to decelerate it and, and get it to land, and only one lit. Oh. So they simply did not, even though it was at full power trying to slow the vehicle down, it couldn't slow it down enough. And so it hit the water at about 120 meters per second. Whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, they, a very rapid disassembly. There was some fish floating around that thing for a while, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. It, well, what's it, if you go back and watch the video, they had the camera on the barge, and suddenly you see a mist appear around the barge. <laughs> And you're thinking it's the it's the, the the booster coming in, but actually what it is is the booster rapidly disassembling a hundred yards away. And there was no time to see it come down. I mean, if it's moving that fast, it it must have just shoom. They have now released footage, nowhere. the little clip of it zipping its way into the water. Wow. It's quite spectacular. Wow. And I'll, I'll include a link on the show notes so you can watch this. There's a new sort of recap video about Falcon Heavy, and they added the clip of the loss of the this center booster. Wow, I was so enamored with the landings and the Tesla. I didn't I didn't actually see that. Well, and they mm. and they walked they walked around it pretty carefully. Like they never talked about it really. Uh mm. the the way the relighting of the engines is one of those very challenging problems. So this, you got to think how do you light a rocket engine? Mm. It's not nobody goes out there with a lighter, right? You it's know, not a simple a thing. Yeah, no bics. <laughs> There's a bunch of different techniques. There is a spark approach, but that is yeah. not what they use. Mm. Uh, they use a pro the same system that Saturn V used, which is the uh, triethyl aluminum and triethyl borane. So these are what they call pyrophoric ignition fuels. So you take these two compounds, they're actually mixed together, and it, you spray it into the engine nozzle So uh, with liquid oxygen flowing. So you gasify the liquid oxygen first. So there's a bunch of liquid oxygen coming in, into the, the combustion chamber, and then you spray TEA, TEB into it, and that ignites. And it actually creates a green flash in that moment. And if you mm -hmm. go back and watch any Falcon 9 launch, heavy or otherwise, you'll see a little green flash just before the engine's all light. Hmm. That is the TEA, TEB igniter. Wow. Now, Neat. their argument is they didn't have enough TEA and TEB on board to light all three engines. I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I th A, I think it's very tough to light these engines when they're coming down engine first into the atmosphere. So you probably use quite a bit, bit of this fuel. But also, the Falcon Heavy core flew higher than any Falcon core they've ever returned. And... I looked up the chemical specification of TEA, TEB. It freezes around negative 100 degrees Celsius. I hmm. wonder if the igniter fluid tank was partially frozen. Hmm. And so they literally didn't have access to enough fuel to light all three. Is engines. that just because it was coming through the atmosphere so fast it was just sort of freezing up? Well, plus it's it's roughly tucked in around where the liquid oxygen tanks and stuff are. Hmm. They That... That core, that center core, flew higher, further, and longer than any other uh, Falcon 9 lower core. So hmm. it's entirely possible that the cold got to the TEA, TEB. I mean, the result is the same. They didn't have enough to light all three engines. Hmm. The but I just don't think they're, they underestimated the amounts. I mean, the only two reasons I could see that they wouldn't have enough, either it was much harder to light it because it was moving faster, or some of it was frozen. Both yeah. are possible. I guess so.
Couldn't isn't that something that they you know the engineers would have picked up on? Um, you know, you would hope that they would have accounted for temperature. Well, they, and they really don't need to explain themselves all that much, right? Like, Mm. because it's a privately held company, so they don't have to tell anybody what the actual problem was and so forth. They've admitted that that was the issue. They had enough fuel on board, Mm. but they didn't, they were supposed to light three engines and they only lit one because they didn't have enough igniter on board. Or there was at least a problem with the igniter, but they haven't been very clear about what's wrong with it. So is a a heavy rocket or a heavy lift rocket like Falcon Heavy required to get to the moon? You know, as much as Falcon Heavy comes in at, in the super heavy class, it's the smallest of the super heavies, right? Like when you talk about the other super heavies, so that would be Saturn V, 130 metric tons, Shuttle C, which would be about 120 metric tons of lift. Mm. Uh, the, the the Russian N1 rocket, the, their competitor to the Saturn V, which was only able to lift about 95 metric tons. Mm. And uh, even the future, the, uh, the, the replacement for N1, which was Energia, which was the Soviet, only flew twice. Uh, it, that's what flew the, the Soviet space shuttle. Okay. That was about 100 metric tons of lift. Ah. Falcon Heavy, fully expendable, 63 metric tons. Yeah. So it's actually the small guy in that class. But it's so much smaller a rocket and cheaper a rocket than any of those other rockets. Mm-hmm. And, and reusable. If, and, and in theory, reusable, although you, it's 63 metric tons, it's fully expended. You're burning all the boosters fully out yeah. and not trying to recover any of them using every bit of fuel. They think they can get 57 metric tons to lower Earth orbit if the outer boosters are recovered. Actually, the far more interesting payload for Falcon Heavy than going to the moon or you know going further out is fully reusable to geosta- lifting seven metric tons to geostationary orbit. So that is wow. your communication satellites. Like those are the most expensive satellites. And you can do this in a $90 million fully reusable mode. Normally those things are lifted by $200 million rockets. So mm-hmm. they cut the price of lifting substantial uh, geostationary satellites. And if you only reuse the outers, if you give up the core, you can double that to 14 metric tons. That uh, Energia um, Russian rocket you talked about, that was like late 80s, early 90s when that You're thing right. was. You're right. Know. Exactly right. Only flew twice. Mm-hmm. And the, fir- the, the first flight uh, was with a thing called the Polyus Payload, which, depending on who you ask, was either a weapons platform in space or just a test payload. Either way, it never made one orbit. Hmm. Supposedly, it was defective. And when it was supposed to do its orbit insertion burn, it did it backwards, so it actually deorbited itself. There's also a story that that the rocketry bureau of the of the Soviet Union flew the payload without proper permission and Gorbachev freaked out and made them deorbit it immediately. Wow. They um and that was in uh, 87 and then in 88 is when the Buran the one Buran flight happened. Hmm. And it just sort of proved that the Soviets could fly a um a, a space shuttle too. It's just that the next year the Soviet Union collapses. Hmm. But the, the, the energy is an extraordinary rocket, right, in the sense that it's really, really efficient. And we may see it come back. Well, yeah, they're supposedly working on a super heavy rocket. Well, that is the real reaction that happened from the Falcon Heavy flying, right? Yeah. More than anything, after Falcon Heavy flying, you see both Russia and China saying, we can fly super heavy rockets, too. But they're not, their aim isn't necessarily to get to the moon, is it? Because they've been there. Well, yeah, I, well, only the Americans have been there. Nobody else has, really. I mean, but I thought put, they've flown around the moon. They have, and yeah. they've they've put uh, and they've soft landed on the moon, right? Yeah. Both the 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 Soviets and the Chinese have soft landed landers on the moon and sent rovers around. So they've right. they've kind of been there, but they have never sent people there, and they need right. a lot awful lot of lift to do that. Mm-hmm. In there was a mission, supposedly a private mission, using the Dragon crew capsule. To fly Falcon Heavy, to fly a couple of wealthy people around the moon using Falcon Heavy. Yeah. Boy, I wonder what that ticket would cost. <laughs> it's a couple of bucks. <laughs> it's a few dollars. The Russian Federation has been offering flights to orbit the moon as well. Huh. Then they wanted, I think it's $250 million for it. And you would go mm. up to the space station and then they would send up a special version of the Soyuz that would allow you to do that flight. Nobody's ever taken them up on it. Yeah, but would they give you free drinks, though? That's the question. <laughs> I'm I mean, pretty sure everything. It's kind of an all-inclusive kind of thing. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. Uh, $250 million. You better not just have Jim Beam. 
I'm yeah. going to want some Woodford. Just saying, you pretty much get to select whatever booze you want. <laughs> and one of the arguments for the weakness in the Falcon Heavy is that upper stage. Yeah. You know, Elon's always been very big on just using RP1 and liquid oxygen. He never wanted to use liquid hydrogen. He, he Liquid hydrogen, serious, while it's a really, really efficient fuel, it's extremely bulky mm. and it's very hard on materials. It is extremely hard to build good liquid uh, hydrogen uh, fuel systems. But they're so efficient, they're usually used in upper stages because of those benefits. In fact, he did admit uh, during a lecture at the 2008 Mars Society Conference that he was considering a hydrogen upper stage for heavy. Okay. And the other problem is that RP1 can freeze, right? Yeah. You can't freeze liquid hydrogen. In fact, you have the opposite problem. It keeps boiling on you. So when yeah. you want a long-lasting upper stage, using a cryogenic fuel is very useful. Methane's probably the better answer, but we've never really tried that. Hmm. You know, the, the comparison between the Saturn V and the N1 rockets with the Saturn V, you know, pulled off its job, flew 13 times. The N1 had four attempts and they all failed uh, for a variety of reasons. We could almost do a show just on that alone. <laughs> but the N1 was just literally half the efficiency yeah. of the Saturn V. It had more power, but it had more stages. The big advantage that the Saturn V had was actually its third stage. Its third stage with that reli relightable J2 engine allowed them to use the third stage not only to complete orbital insertion, but to do the lunar injection burn to go to the moon. The and N1 had two different rockets for that. So for those who don't know or, or, or missed it, the, the Soviet N1 moon rocket was, uh, as Richard said, crashed. It, it never got off the ground, and that started in the 60s. The Energia, which we were just talking about, made um, uh, at least two successful flights in 87 and 88 in the late 80s yeah, yeah. although it was a leo a low earth system right yeah. the n1 was meant to send men to the moon they were trying to keep up with saturn 5 but their first the first flights in february of 69 it gets off the ground but then malfunctions and crashes yeah. after a couple of minutes the second flight if you ever go watch, looking for a video of the n1 moon rocket you're mm -hmm. going to see a video of a tremendous explosion that's the second launch attempt in july of 69 yeah. where it just clears the pad and then a huge malfunction mm -hmm. the lower stage shuts down and the whole rocket falls back onto the pad and blows the pad <laughs> up this, it's arguably the largest non-nuclear explosion ever made. Wow. You also mentioned the Buran orbiter, which was yes. their version of the space shuttle. Yeah. Yeah. That was 80s, and that only flew the once. And then, this, of course, the Soviet Union ends in, in 91, 91, Yeah. right? Yeah. And that's the first, you know, it's only after 91 that they even admit about the N1. The, the Americans knew about the N1 rocket because after that big explosion in 69, mm spy satellites could see the hole right. <laughs> uh, and they did try two more times but both those launches failed and then they canceled it but they'd ha they'd actually built more rockets and they they try the soviets tried to erase that the n1 ever happened they tried to keep it a secret yeah. and supposedly destroyed everything but interestingly enough you know, they were dis the leadership was disobeyed and they store the engines the nk15s which were the engines for the first stage they kept a bunch of those engines and sold them to the Americans in the late in the in the 90s. That's mm. what Aerojet bought. Wow. Right? Wow. What what Lockheed Martin bought for their Atlas V, the RD180, that's a ha, a, a modified version of the RD170 that ran the Energia rocket. You know, at the end of the at the end of the Soviet Union, the US is trying to put money into Russia to stabilize it to make it more democratic. And so, you know, as much as Elon used the fact that there that Russian relations are on downturn and that the that Lockheed Martin is using a Russian engine, it was the American government that pushed Lockheed Martin to mm -hmm. use that engine. And that RD one eighty engine is one of the most efficient engines ever made. So we're clearly going to have to talk more about this. We're going to have to do more shows on heavy rockets because obviously China and Russia coming back with uh, heavy rockets. Who knows what's going to happen there? Well, it's one of the reasons that I bring up Energia is that Energia only flew twice. It was only at the beginning stages of its potential. The, there was a design called for Energia 2. 
And Energia 2, so what was cool about the Energia design is that they had a central core that ran uh, liquid hydrogen, uh, liquid oxygen thrust, very similar to the space shuttle, except that instead of putting the engines on, on the shuttle, it put the engines on the booster and threw it away. The four outside boosters, they actually became the Zenit rockets. This is this RD-180, RD-170 engine using RP-1. Mm. So they, could, they figured they could upgrade that to actually have those boosters fly home. Yeah. Give them folding wings and landing gear. And after they'd done their boost, literally turn around, fly them back. And in the Energy of Two, they were talking about having up to eight of those boosters. So now you're talking about getting into the 200 metric tons to low Earth orbit range. Like that is a yeah. powerful rocket. Yeah. Those designs in many ways, even though they're from that late 80s, early 90s, are still contemporary. Huh. With a little bit of modernization, the Russians could be flying something like that and starting to have some serious heavy lift. So what do you know about what China's doing with the heavy rocket? So all we've heard from China so far is they've announced a new rocket called the Long March 9. All of mm -hmm. their big rockets are called Long March, after Mao's famous right. march. Uh, apparently their goal is 140 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Of course, it would be slightly more than Saturn V, uh, and up to 50 metric tons to translunar injection, which puts it right in the same league they think they were going to make flights to the moon by the 2013. Uh, the only really interesting bit is they is the description of the first stage. Another RP-1 liquid oxygen engine that they figure will come in at 480 metric tons of thrust. The Saturn V first stage was 680 metric tons. So they actually have a subscale model of this engine called the YF-100. It's running at about 120 uh, metric tons. That's pretty powerful. It's and, and more, far more efficient. You gotta remember the the F one engine was an anomaly. It's yeah. the most powerful liquid fuel engine by a long way. Uh, it is uh, incredibly inefficient and very expensive to manufacture. So much hmm. of that F one engine was handmade. Yeah, you know because that was the way things were in those early days. They just didn't really have an ability to do much more than that. And the and the engine was not especially efficient. So the fact that someone's even considering building an engine near that class, hmm. that kind of power range, that'll yeah. it'll be an extraordinarily powerful engine if they get there. Wow. So where's NASA and all this? You don't hear from them too much anymore. Well, they I think it took them a day to say congratulations to Elon, which is a bit embarrassing, seeing how they flew from, you know, Cape Canaveral and all. Mm. Uh, the space launch system is still in development. And I think it's important to remember that NASA didn't necessarily want the space launch system. They didn't really have a mission for it and so forth. What, what is this that is, exactly, the space launch system? Is that their sort of extra uh, helping other third-party companies do it? No, no. Space what launch is, is na it, What space launch system is really doing is saying, let's use everything we learned about shuttle to build a safer rocket that doesn't carry a shuttle, that carries normal payloads. So basically take the fuel, the big orange fuel tank from the space shuttle and put the engines on the bottom of it, put the solid rocket boosters on the side, although make them even longer and bigger, and you get a really powerful rocket. It's a lot like Shuttle C, except just stacked like a regular rocket. Okay. Um, the problem is that they're, they're flying so rarely, they're, they're still very much in the traditional model of space manufacturing that SpaceX has disrupted so much that it's looking sillier as time goes by. Hmm. It, they got money in 2017 to work on. So the week, the, the bottom stage is going to work. There's no question about that, right? Okay. Bottom stage boosters, that's a known uh, entity, right? That's a, they're back to a 10 meter rocket, the, the 33 foot wide uh, central core, which is really, really big. That's Saturn V big, right? Where remember Falcon heavies, each one of those cores is 3.6 meters across. Wow, yeah. They're small. Yeah. Right? That's that's really minimum size. Yeah. So getting back into 10-meter building is a big deal. And But it's the upper stage that's the problem. So they have an, an upper stage that's really based on the uh, Atlas V's upper stage. So it's substantially smaller. It only has one RL-10 engine. It's, it's, it's underpowered, which is also the problem with Falcon Heavy. That yeah. upper stage is underpowered for doing any big missions. Mm-hmm. They've got funding to build the what they call the exploration upper stage. So that is basically scaling up the upper stage to that same larger barrel size and like a eight meter size with four RL10s. Hmm. 
Hmm. That makes it a much more powerful rocket. And you got to understand those those liquid hydrogen upper stages are important. If you sat a fal a Falcon Heavy beside an Atlas V, both in full configuration, their maximum power, and you had them send the same payload to Jupiter, the Atlas V would actually get there first. Because because huh. the Atlas V's upper stage with that RL-10 is yeah. so much more efficient, mm. it's effective at, at upper stage lift. Mm. Falcon Heavy is definitely held back by its weaker upper stage. Right. So they're going to have to make a better upper stage. They really want to do these high payload missions. Like there's, there's no 50 metric ton payloads out there right now. <laughs> you know, every space station component was less than 20 metric tons because it had to fit in the shuttle. <laughs> so we've never flown anything really heavy. Like you actually need a payload heavy enough. So SLS is still on schedule. They're supposed to fly the first uh, block one version late this year, 2018, probably will slip to 2019 and that that's with an unmanned orion capsule and uh service module to go uh in a luber f lunar fly around mm. so an apollo 8 style mission it probably slipped to 2019 uh the manned one uh could be as early as 2021 probably more likely 2023 and that would be a manned flight around the moon wow well there's certainly a lot of stuff to watch right and the, and the, of course the reality here is Falcon Heavy is not a real competitor to SLS because it's so narrow. Ah. Because it's only 3.6 meters wide with a 5 meter fairing, it can only take relatively small payloads. Even though it can lift a lot, it can't take a lot of volume. You actually need more volume, and that's where SLS has an advantage. It can take a larger volume. But BFR blows that up. You know, we've already done the BFR yeah. show, but the BFR is where you suddenly have 150 metric tons of lift and lots of room so that you can do a lot with it. And I think one of the reasons that Falcon Heavy is sort of an afterthought now, after all this time, hmm. you know, of changes and modifications and so forth, is that Elon thinks he can have uh, test flights of the Falcon, uh, of the big Falcon ship by next year, by 2019. That's crazy. But you know what? We said that before. He can yeah. do it, probably. But he's always been late. I think he's going to be late again. He's saying he's not going to man rate Falcon Heavy. Right. He's going to man rate the Falcon 9 full thrust because that will fulfill the the crew mission to the space station. So they're testing the, the Crew Dragon right now. But one of the challenges here is getting man rated. Mm. Man rating is very difficult. You have to have you have to keep under three G, so you have to throttle your engines and so forth properly to not overstress it because the stress goes up. I mean, they even had this problem with uh, with Saturn V, yeah. where they actually shut down the center engine earlier in the flight before the main, the other four engines ran out of fuel because it just got to be too much G's for the for the astronauts. Uh, you've got to have all this redundancy. You've got to have an escape system. Like, there's a lot of stuff, hmm. and. NASA has cut corners at time, and I'm sure I'll get NASA people yelling at me at that, around safety for their own vehicles, and I'm looking at you, shuttle. <laughs> uh, they're going to be hard as hell on, on SpaceX. Yeah. And they're going to be hard on, on uh, Lockheed Martin, too, right? The, both of the crew transport missions to the space station with the CS-100, which is the Lockheed Martin one, that's going to fly on Atlas V. And Atlas V can be easily man-rated because it has such a long history of successful flight. No mm. Atlas V has ever malfunctioned. Wow. Falcon 9 full thrust just didn't have, a, have as much reputation. Elon's on record saying, we're freezing the Falcon 9 full thrust design now so that we can build up enough flights mm. to actually prove that it's reliable enough to carry the crew capsule. Mm. And and it, if you look at the manifest of how many flights they've got coming, like they're going to fly 30 times this year. Mm. And so that will get them over the man rating hump for Falcon uh, 9 full thrust. But to fly heavy that much, they don't mm. have the missions. They don't have the need. There's mm. no justification for it. So man rating it is just too expensive. And in that, in the time it would take to get enough heavy flights in to Italy man rated, he thinks he can have BFR done in time. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's what I got, buddy. So, Richard, before we end today, yes. I want to announce a, a brand new segment of the Geek Out show. It's called Stump Richard. Okay. Now, people know about you because they listen to .NET Rocks and they know that you have some 
uh, cranial powers that mere mortals don't have. And y- you, you know a lot of stuff and you read things and you don't forget them. So I'm wondering if you know the following. There's a way that you can slow the speed of light down to 38 miles per hour. <laughs> Do you know how? That's probably with cryogenics and a Bose-Einstein condensate. Close. Mm-hmm. You're right about the, the, the cold. Right. You have to have a, a cold uh, amount of some element. Can you guess what the element is? An ultra-cold gas of some atoms from this particular element. Oh, I can't, I can't imagine if it would be a particular material. It's really, it'll probably be helium just because that's something you can cool the most. Oh, uh, you're close. Yeah. I don't know. I'd say you're actually close. It's actually sodium. Sodium? Yeah. Wow. The sodium's substantially heavier, so it's surprising that they would use sodium for that. I'm going to put a link to this, and I heard about this by watching QI and Stephen Fry, of course. And uh, this was an experiment where they basically say only in a vacuum is the speed of light a constant independent of the motions of the source and the observer. And Dr. Howe's feat here is achieved by passing light through an unusual system, an ultra-cold gas of sodium atoms bathed in laser light. When light travels through a transport medium such as glass or water, it moves slightly slower than in a vacuum. The effect leads to refraction, which is the bending of light as it passes from one medium to another. And that's important because without it, lenses and eyeglasses wouldn't be possible. So the phenomenon is also familiar to those who've seen sun rays pass through a glass prism. The rays bend as they enter the glass. Since the refraction effect is slightly different for different colors, white light is separated into individual components, producing the rainbow. So almost all substances have indexes of refraction, only somewhat larger than one. So what did they do here? They, they shone a laser light of a particular color on the ultra-cold sodium atoms. And for such a quantum system, an index of refraction varying rapidly with color creates a huge reduction in the speed of light. And the variation of the index of refraction depends not only on the medium, but also on the properties of the laser light. So it's, in, it's a fascinating experiment. Yeah, very interesting. And there's been a bunch of experiments of playing with slowing down the speed of light. So, yeah, it, it is. It's, like I said, it's, uh, the speed of light is only a constant in vacuum. Yep. Anyway, there you go. Uh, cool. You've been stumped. I love it. <laughs> All right. Oh, before we go. Yeah. Charles Wallace, the guest that uh, the uh, listener that we read the question from at the beginning. Yeah. The, com- the comment. Mm-hmm. He sent me an email. About Oumuamua. Oumuamua? Do you remember Oumuamua? Oumuamua. No, it doesn't ring a bell. This sort of ring a bell. Oumuamua was the asteroid that came from outside the solar system that we first spotted back in October of 2017. Okay. And, of course, the reason we knew it came from outside the solar system was it was moving so fast that it actually is going to fly right back out of the solar system. It's going to take uh, a spin around the, the sun and is whizzing away. Huh. So he, he, he asked that quite, he sent me a message privately where he said, is there any chance that we could use Falcon Heavy, for example, to catch that asteroid? The asteroid was odd, not only to come from outside of the solar system, but it was strobing. It, it, it reflected light at irregular rates. They eventually figured out that it was probably about a cigar shaped, about 200 meters long and 35 meters in diameter, huh. spinning at a rate that was like a road, spinning on its axis every 7.3 hours. Wow. And they only saw it, uh, the PANSTARS, which is the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System, which is meant for tracking asteroids in the solar system. You know, that's how we stop being the dinosaurs, so we can mm. actually see stuff coming at us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It only saw it after it already passed the sun and was passing away. Uh, it was within 18 million kilometers of Earth and was headed away. Hmm. But there was a, a question of, is that actually an artificial satellite? Did aliens send something to check out our solar system? And, Let's ask you know, Mark Miller. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, rule number one: it's never aliens. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> it's not that. But that's Charles was asking: like, could we possibly intercept it with with heavy? And uh, I I looked it up, did the math. Uh, the answer is no, <laughs> and the the reason is it's moving too fast. So to go fast enough to escape 
the sun's gravity, right? So if you think about Voyager 1, Voyager 2, which have actually left the solar system now, they're actually mm. outside the heliopause, mm -hmm. they had to get above 42 kilometers per second. And they used they did that by doing close passes on Jupiter to slingshot them way mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. At its peak speed, Oumuamua was moving at 87 kilometers per second. Good Lord. That is booting it. Although, <laughs> it's decelerating. Like, here's huh. the question. At 87 kilometers per second, how long is it going to take for it to exit the solar system? Right? Oh, yeah, it was only yeah. going that fast at Mercury's orbit. But as it was moving away, of course, the sun is pulling on it, so it's decelerating. Yeah, sure. And at this point, it's already past Mars. So we got pictures of it as it passed Earth in October. By November, it was past Mars. It'll reach Jupiter's orbit, but not Jupiter, in May of this year of 2018. Huh. It'll take until January 2019 to get to Saturn's orbit. Again, remember, it's decelerating. Yeah. It shouldn't actually clear the heliopause for 20,000 years. Wow. It's just, really slowing. The, it's just the nature of slowing things down. So, you know, brings up another interesting point, which is, you know, we've all talked about what happens when an asteroid's coming directly for the Earth and it's too close for comfort. Will we have time to respond? And I think... The, the answer is we're going to have to have a rocket at the ready at all times, you know, and Elon's probably just the right guy to figure out what kind of nudge or push or, or, or whatever to give one of these things so that, you know, in time so that it will, uh, will miss the earth. The, the, well, the problem number one is, can we see it? Right. Yeah. So there's a new satellite coming online probably next year called the large synoptic Service telescope, mm -hmm. which should be able to photograph the entire night sky hmm. every week. Hmm. And it is about 14 times more sensitive to pan stars, so it should be able to pick stuff up sooner. Now, normal asteroids in the solar system have regular orbits that we can see, so hmm. we should get decades of warning about a particular collision because yeah. we can figure out the orbits enough to say, we might collide here. Right. The worst-case scenario by far is actually an, an Amuamua. Yeah, something that comes out of nowhere and leaves exactly. just as fast. But he, if he comes in at that kind of speed, he only got up to 87 kilometers per second because it was falling towards the sun. Mm. So as long as you see it far enough away, yeah, you get a sh you you have a shot at it. So the ability to look for it further away, and we didn't see it till it had already gone past the sun and was coming out past the Earth again. It, we just didn't see it soon enough. Yeah. Well, it's a good mission for quantum computing and uh, big data to to, well, to work on, isn't it? I think it's more about sensitivity of sensors. Yeah. You know, one of the arguments for building ultra-sensitive telescopes, and perhaps that means putting them into orbit with really big rockets, is to be able to catch those asteroids early enough to mm. protect the planet. Very good. Well, that's a show, my friend. Thank Stellar you, as always. No pun and intended. It's been a while since you did Geek Out, so you get a long one today. Yeah. And we'll have to revisit this topic again. There's a lot there. All right. We'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and of course in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a